All right, hello, welcome to Ben's OP Game Show, recorded live, 3 p.m. Pacific time, every Friday, twitch.tv slash thegamefanatics dot dot com, I don't know, not dot com, twitch.tv slash dot com. On this week's show, we're going to be talking about The Last of Us 2, or part 2, if you want to be all weird about it, just a little bit, and reviews of Mario Odyssey and Wolfenstein 2. It is odd. You know what? People have said I need... Uh, like some kind of background music and I think they're not wrong but I mean where am I gonna find the time Wh where could I possibly find this music but first we're gonna go into the last of us two my little now I've prepared statements so the latest teaser for the last of us two last of us part two Ooh, excuse me, was pretty violent, but was it too much? Let me actually rephrase that. Was an M-rated game where you murder people brutally with knives, guns, etc. advertised with violence? Yes, it was. Okay, well then maybe we're being just a little bit ridiculous here, gaming press, that went a little overboard. I've seen many, many, many headlines focus on the violence, if not outright in the headline, saying that it was too much. And Twitter, well, was a tweeting, and it came to about the same consensus. But I think it can show violence because it's cool, because it's shocking, because it's The Last of Us, and because they can sell it however they want. Now, there is a point to be made that maybe it was a bit too much for a stage presentation at Paris Games Week, but the domestic abuse Detroit preview, several minutes before it, should have given it away that this was not a show for children. So I'm 100% in the camp of Sony and Naughty Dog can do whatever the hell they want, and the good news is, a lot of the same gaming press that was criticizing the violence is as well. But are they? Article after article was written asking if it was too much, if Sony should be showing it, and yet there was a constant message that they want developers artists to have no restrictions to their game's vision. But I don't get it. By making a big deal about this violence, you might have compromised that very aspect. Will Naughty Dog tone down this scene in the final game? Probably not, but who's to say? And hell, maybe it won't be in the game and was never planned to be. Could have just been another tone piece. The scene isn't the issue. Who cares? It's the scenes that are being written today. It's the scenes that'll be written next week, next month, next whatever. Now there's a nagging thought in people's minds. Maybe not all members of Naughty Dog, but definitely enough. Thoughts of, is this too much? Are we making the game too violent? What if we did this here instead? And what if this subconsciously alters someone's vision? Is it still the true artist's vision that you wanted? when they've been inceptioned? To write these articles with headlines claiming it was too much, like it isn't going to have any effect, is naive and ignorant. And it would be hyperbole to also say that The Last of Us Part 2 is compromised. But let's hope everyone on the team doesn't hesitate with their artistic vision. And with that thought, I think it's clear that this one teaser has undoubtedly changed the game in some way. And we'll never really know. Even if it hadn't had this violence issue, some unconscious changes would have been made based on feedback, positive or negative, whatever, but I still struggle to think how condemning violence in a violent series makes any sense at all. Anyway, I just want to get that all out there. I really liked the tease and I kind of don't want to see anything else until I play the game in 2020 or so. It's just a little confusing by some of the things I saw over the last week about this trailer and how did we play the same game did I watch the same trailer it is brutal but I it didn't really go kind of too crazy out, out of and it, as, as Del Fox in the chat says it's like condemning jumping in Mario it is somewhat along the same lines maybe maybe Long jumping. Oh, that's too much now. It's too much long jumping. There was a lot of choking. I will say that I was surprised at the amount of choking in The Last of Us Part 2 trailer. But besides that, I think we can kind of chillax just a little bit. Ah! <laughs> the 
See, the problem with background music is I'd have to figure out some way to do it here. And I don't really know how I can do that. So now prepare for me to read more and a much longer thing. Just hold on. It's happening. This will be the full text of the review I wrote. It ended up being way too goddamn long, but you will get to see gameplay of me sucking at a game. So congratulations. Oh, hold on. Can I get that off? There we go. I know how to make things work. Every once in a while, I can do it. Wolfenstein 2, the new Colossus, picked quite the year to release its sequel, didn't it? But marketing and current events aside, it is great to see a AAA single-player first-person shooter with no tacked-on multiplayer or microtransactions. Even better, the game was an excellent sequel with one of the best shooter campaigns in years. Just look at how terrible I am. How could you not be convinced? Now, Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus picks up exactly where the first game left off and even includes a thorough recap for new players. The main point driven home is that the hero, William B.J. Blazkowicz, is on death's doorstep. The ragtag group you assembled and got to know in the first game tried their best to keep him alive and continue taking down the Nazis, but he's a shell of his former self. His mind flashes back to his childhood upbringing and his racist and abusive father, and then flashes to the present, where Anya is pregnant with his children and he doesn't think he'll live to help raise them. This guilt of the potential future and the nagging sadness of the past haunt BJ for much of the game. This narrative thread is, surprisingly, brought into the gameplay. In his weakened state, BJ spends the opening of the game in a wheelchair, and is only later granted movement through a suit of power armor introduced previously. The following escapades happen so quickly he doesn't have time to take the suit off, and he fears that if he does, it will be the end. This is powerful and thought-provoking stuff that you'll hear through BJ's internal monologue, and it is something a lesser game would not include at all. The strength of this narrative is further helped by its sheer confidence. Wolfenstein 2 goes there. It shocks, awes, and left me wanting more in the best ways possible. Now, the only downside to such a personal tale having a large role in the plot is that taking down the Nazi regime is uh, more of an added bonus rather than the overt goal. I'm okay with that. But it did make the final act abrupt, and some characters have moments that were not earned because of this. Wolfenstein The New Order had a similar problem with Bombate, but it's much more obvious here. And I'm being intentionally vague through all of this, because Wolfenstein 2 is one hell of a ride. Several scenes left me so stunned and genuinely impressed that I'm trying my best to avoid spoiling any of it at all. It's great. It's great. And don't worry, the Fergit or Wyatt timeline choice from the first game is still presented at the start of this one, it's still relevant, and it features enough changes to warrant another playthrough if you're so inclined. I only played about a third of another timeline and enjoyed the differences quite a bit. However, nothing I saw made the core narrative different at all. In fact, there were very obvious points where Fergus or Wyatt would talk with BJ and no one else at length, and then someone else interjects, and the scene proceeds as normal with less interaction from them. It's expected, but can feel awkward if you are looking for it. The excellent and payoff-filled narrative comes paired with some of the most fun shooting I've had in a long time. It cannot be overstated how great it is to dual-wield shotguns and mow down Nazis trapped in a tight corridor, blood, limbs, and shell casings littering the floor. All the mechanics from the first return and give players even more options than before. Dual wielding has been enhanced, allowing you to pair up any two of your weapons together to make BJ an efficient killing machine. Also returning are the various perks that are leveled up by performing specific actions. Take down more enemies silently and you'll be able to move more quickly when crouched, kill more Nazis with a grenade and you can carry more, and so on. Wolfenstein 2 constantly gives you feedback about your progress with these perks regardless of how you play, giving it the feel of leveling up in an RPG. Don't worry, it completely complements all the shooting and all the Nazi killing. It's not all going in with guns blazing though. Leaning up and around cover is still as fast and fun as ever and is often an integral strategic element. Adding to that, the stealth mechanics are as fun as they are gruesome. Throwing knives is so 2014. We've moved on to axes now, and that simple change is unbelievably fun. Sneaking behind an enemy unseen lets you initiate a takedown, and each one is brutal, often leaving severed arms and legs thrown about the ground like a child who just didn't want to pick up their toys. 
Even the normal melee attacks are instant kill moves and leave the enemy in shambles. It's always satisfying and I'd go out of my way just to watch a Nazi die a horrible death. Plus you could throw these axes ridiculous distances and nailing a headshot from downtown is exhilarating. Almost every level has several commanders on patrol that will sound the alarm if they spot BJ, but take them out unseen and reinforcements can't flood the battlefield. It's a great reward and something you should always attempt, even if the enemy routes can be difficult to plot sometimes. Thankfully, Wolfenstein 2 now lets you save at any point, and that will improve your chances. More importantly, manual saves prevent these sometimes obnoxiously far apart checkpoints from being too much of a slog. The game is difficult, not unfair, but a handful of difficulty spikes lessened what would have been incredible set piece moments, forcing the player to, in an entirely new area, survive webs, webs, waves of enemies with no time to prepare never felt quite right to me. I wasn't trapped in a corner, I was let loose in the open, with enemies all around and explosive barrels peppered about. I won't claim to be a great shooter player, but when I died more than twice at a given checkpoint, I'd rethink my strategy and get past it. The sections I'm talking about made that impossible, and even crazier, when I did succeed, it was either because of manual saves or dumb luck. And this struggle was also antithetical to what was going on narrative-wise. Thankfully, these moments are few and far between. Shooting through Nazis, large armored battle suits, and androids is a buttery smooth experience the rest of the time. The timeline choice at the beginning of Wolfenstein 2 also changes which utility weapon you get. Gone are the days of awkwardly cutting square holes in fences and grates. Now, depending on the timeline, you'll either disintegrate the wall instantly with a laser, or blow it up with what is essentially a C4 launcher. Both weapons are very powerful, but have limited ammo supplies that we can be but they can be refilled at the occasional wall mounted station. Not perfect at this yet. In addition to normal weapons, there are four heavy weapons that are usually found on the corpse of its previous owner after an intense and strategic battle. They are immensely powerful and incredibly fun to use. Disintegrating Nazis from across the room with a laser, sending 30 bullets a second into a Nazi filled hallway, launching fire over a car to melt the, fle melt the flesh off a hiding Nazi, or firing an insta-kill bomb onto some backwards-ass racist homophobic bigot Nazi to ruin their day, it's always a good time. Carrying these weapons slows you down, and the ammo is scarce, but it could be exactly what you need to turn the tide of battle. However, not everything is perfect on the shooting front. Armor, health, and ammo are almost always constantly littered on the ground. It's just everywhere. Walking over them will pick them up automatically, but only when you're very close. Therefore, I found myself constantly pressing a button to pick up these power-ups. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it's about as fun as picking up a spilled deck of cards. And you need these items to survive, so it's not like you can just ignore it, walk on by. Which brings me to the health system, which I feel like I have to explain in way too much detail. For much of the game, 50 is the highest your health will regenerate to, but this can be expanded to 200 through pickups. Your health will slowly drain back to 50, though. There's also armor, which won't drain and goes from 0 to 200. I like this system overall as it is a throwback to FPS games of yore. However, because of the high variance of these numbers and lack of any visual representation beyond the on-screen number, it can make the game feel uneven. Having max health and armor makes you a god, but only having 50 health is pitiful. And in a game where a Nazi with a shotgun could come behind you and kill you instantly, it can lessen the fun. Not knowing exactly how many shots you can take at any given time before you have to retreat is confusing. And I don't think it's worth having the godlike heights of the health and armor system if it's going to lead to unexpected deaths. When not shooting or enjoying the story, seen here, the levels offer plenty of secrets to find. Notes, gold, records, concept art, and more are scattered about in high numbers. There's also hidden upgrade kits that allow you to upgrade your weapons in many different ways. Maybe it's a silencer for the pistol, double clip size for the shotgun, or armor piercing rounds for the machine gun. Roughly halfway through the game, there is a choice between three different enhancements that affect combat and traversal. It might sound like a tough choice at first, but through side missions you can obtain all three and even power them up further. It's a great idea and I loved the extra perks and abilities, but I won't spoil them here. There's a lot to spoil. I think going in fresh is very good for this game, since it's only like 12 hours. All commanders you take out drop Enigma codes, which can be used to attempt to attempt a minigame to open up optional side missions. Almost every single main story level is replayable through these missions, letting you pick up 
any missed collectibles in addition to killing a new target commander. Naturally, enemies are back patrolling, and oftentimes you have to go through the level backwards, which keeps it somewhat fresh. It's a great touch that allows you to have more fun with the gunplay after or before the credits roll. Even though I think the ending mission is a tad abrupt, I really enjoyed the ride. It's full of memorable moments in both the story and gameplay that I'll be thinking about for a while. Seeing members of the KKK in full regalia walk around the streets of the US is haunting, but the game doesn't go into enough detail. The specifics of Nazi occupation and the transition of power are not expanded on much despite being incredibly interesting aspects of this whole concept. If you hoped slash were afraid Wolfenstein 2 was going to have some grand message or hidden meaning in the plot in relation to the current political climate, you'll either be disappointed or relieved by its very simple message, Nazis are bad. It's what the series has been about for like 30 years now after all. With one of the more memorable campaigns in years, and gunplay that is nothing if not succulent, Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus is truly something special. Also, you can hurl an axe across the map into an unsuspecting Nazi's face, and that's sure to brighten anyone's day. Haunting because they look like ghosts? Ooh, I like it though, but man, there's, a, there's an optional side mission where you get to kill members of the KKK. <laughs> and it's funny because it's like why are they here oh they're here just because you get to kill them like that's the only reason because when you see them in the campaign you can't kill them it's a it's like a story sequence I'm like why are these kkk guys here with guns and i'm like i'm just gonna throw axes at them it's stupid fun to throw axes in this game and i really enjoyed it i do think i was a little down on it for a bit because of the weird difficulty spikes like there's just points in this game that are so obnoxious of like why wasn't there a checkpoint here or why is there one guy like if you killed let's say there was 10 guys in a room right and you killed nine of them and like the what you can't find the one guy and you think he's dead you don't even know he's there so you're walking around and you'll get killed by this one guy and somehow you'll have to redo the whole encounter even though you've been walking around safely for minutes and minutes which is a little a little weird sometimes hey touchstones but other than that i i love the story and it's a just like it's cool to see a game do these moments i kept having like oh this is happening and then it would like pull the rug out on you like oh this is happening like this and there's also one uh story mission that does what i wanted a level in titanfall 2 to do which and i outlined i think i made a video about this a year ago about titanfall 2 and like how that assembly line level should have played out to be actually super cool they, they, it's only a five minute sequence in this game, but they really do what I wanted them to do in Titanfall 2, and I was super pleased by that. It's also gorgeous. I managed to do a whole review, didn't, didn't mention the graphics really, pretty good. The story scenes are lengthy, and I think it's, it's great that they, they allow it to do that. It's not, oh, now you got to shoot a bunch of random things for five minutes just because we thought you might get bored. Like, no, it, it tells its story, and it's a really compelling tale. I think there was that one comment of, uh, like speedrunners were speedrunning the game and it's like oh the story stuff is three hours or something i'm like i'm not surprised there was a lot a lot to get through and, and it's impressive to to see something like this that's it's all good and i really enjoyed watching it um, in a first person shooter campaign that isn't you know the last of us or whatever really really good stuff but i know del fox i know you're here for mario so we'll go to mario We'll also go and cut this off before there's a brutal beheading on the screen because maybe we should just, we should just not, we should just not, right? I think so. Uh, uh, watch, watch out, there's an axe, watch out. Okay, I just have one thing I have to change here real quick. Now we can talk about Mario Odyssey. Good lord, is it a good game. Now this is basically a review of the main campaign because, yeah, right? Because I just beat the game. I think I, I mean, I beat the game with 350 moons or something stupid like that. I think I have four, 420, haha. <laughs> roughly about that now. And 
wow, did I enjoy the ride getting there? And it, it's ugh, there's so much to talk about with Mario Odyssey and what I love about 3D platformers, which is the collecting. You know, I'm a big Banjo Kazooie fan. I love finding all the Jinjos and finding all the pieces and then you're going in the hub world and you're like, I need three more pieces to get this. I, I loved that growing up and it's it shaped me as a psychopath. So I I love what Mario Odyssey did it, in the collectathon idea because it's so damn smart. What they did, we'll start with the coins. So they have coins, right? The normal coins. And those are just freaking coins. Who cares? They're just coins. You can collect them, you don't have to collect them, eh, right? They serve as your lives, you lose 10 when you die, who cares, you have thousands of them, it doesn't matter. They're for buying crap. So they took away that to, to be, you know, it's not your health like it was in Mario 64, it's not that. And they added in 50 to 100 purple coins specific to each world. So it has that whole collect-a-thon thing, of, but it's scaled back. And it's per world. It's not It's not there's a thousand lums in the entire game, Rayman 2, or 999, depending. It's not like that. They're all sectioned off perfectly. And then what they did was they took away all the extra crap. So you know, and I'll use Banjo-Kazooie as an example. Because in Banjo-Kazooie, you can collect the mumbo-jumbo tokens. You can collect... The, the Jinjos, which is like five, or is it five or six? I think five in each level. There's the Jiggies, which are the puzzle pieces. There's all these different things. The feathers, the all, well, I mean, those are for your items. But there's all these different things you can collect. And what they did in Mario Odyssey was say, let's just have you collect moons. What do you need? You need moons. And they just decided, let's put moons everywhere. And it's glorious there are moons just literally falling out of the sky and it's so good because it it's exactly what kind of breath of the wild did where you'd see a, a mountain or something go like what the hell is that over there let me go over there and mess with it and it takes it into the 3d platformer genre this is you know comparisons that they weren't intentionally probably doing but you'll see something and go like i'm gonna climb that and you look up there and like yeah there's a moon at the top of it or you're like, there's this weird thing on the ground. Here we go. This is something. And you're always rewarded with a moon. And I love that. Being constantly rewarded, shocking, is fun. And it doesn't matter that the, the bulk of this single player campaign, or whatever you want to call it, is pretty easy. It's not, it's not crazy. There are a few moments that are definitely more difficult. That the in the process of 100 percenting I'm pretty close. I have to say that the very moons, the very moons. What's that? Yeah, most were just, and that, that was funny too. There's this thing at the end that a, the toadette that just gives it's like, oh, you've done a bunch of things, and I had to sit there for five minutes talking to toadette, and she just gave you more and more moons. Like you've jumped 500 times. Here's a moon. Here's a, you've collected a you you beat the game here's a moon I'm like all right Toadette Jesus but it is very few moons oh okay very few moons were infuriating yeah I I agree there's a there's been a couple like I don't want to do that but even it's so fun to be because like all these little optional weird doorways that you go into they all have at least one hidden moon so you'd be going into them and you're like okay that's the goal that's where it wants me to go. But where doesn't it want me to go? I have to figure that out. And there's one in the Hat Kingdom I was trying to get yesterday that I don't know how to get. And it's like, it's, I know what's in here. I know what's in here, but I don't know where it is. And it that's like the only one I'm talking about. But anyway, that's a really cool angle of now I'm looking around this corner and like, how do I get over there? Because that's the optional moon. Or it's like this trick jump to get the optional moon. Ton of fun. I love just getting in a world and finding its stuff. I spent hours in in uh, the desert area, Tostarina or Tostadas or whatever it's called. I spent so many hours there just exploring, and it's actually one of the areas with one of the most amount of moons in the entire game. And it's just a joy. I think...
Awesome movement. Yeah, I think everything controls super well, except for two things. The 2D Mario stuff is phenomenal. And oh my god. It's, uh, yeah, I got it. <laughs> I figured it out. But the, the 2D stuff is great. And like going across walls and like link between worlds stuff. And some of the stuff they do in the post game that I've seen so far is, is amazing. I love the 2D stuff. But you can't use the D-pad for one. And for two, it doesn't control like I want it to. It doesn't control like Mario World or even New Super Mario. It just doesn't control right. Not that it's uncontrollable they just changed the movement enough to where as someone who's a psychopath like me and has played hundreds of hours of mario maker this is not the same and the only other thing with the controls is that the motion controls are garbage god i hate them i know there's some of those things you can do not without the motion controls but playing this on a pro controller is so good but Oh, and you can still do the motion controls on the pro controller, but it is not fun to do motion controls. Like I love Odyssey or Odyssey. I love Galaxy where you can jump and then do like a little double jump by waggling. That is like all I think motion controls should be that and aiming. That's it. And it's not like you really need to do all that stuff that often, but it is annoying. I just wish how it controlled like you would expect. Yeah, it is different. Like, they give you... It feels like more in-air movement in the 2D Mario stuff. You can kind of turn around more quickly than you could. It's weird. Yeah, I, I think that is a, is a difference there, too, Delphox, where the, uh, the Joy-Cons being separated would be better because when you're using a controller that's, like, combined... Even if you're just using the Joy-Con grip with the two controllers in it. I can't throw the hat. Like, I could throw the hat, but I'm, like, throwing everything. If I could just be moving with the left thing and throwing it with the right thing. My things are hands. Or my hands are things. That would be better. And I, I just don't like doing it with the Pro Controller. I think it would be fine with the, the little Joy-Cons. But I'm not. I'm not going back the pro controller is so good it cannot be understated overstated one of those statements the pro controller is perfect this is the best controller they've made since the wave bird it is so goddamn good and like i can do everything you know i can do the circle thing with it and i'm like i'm trying to do it but like sometimes it doesn't do it i'm like i just don't i just don't care this could be a button or some other way. There's plenty of buttons on this controller. But I mean, we're we're grasping at straws if I'm like, the motion controls that are optional aren't very good. And I think to me, this is exactly what I'd want, not only from a Mario game, but from like any 3D platformer. It is so damn good. And, and there's just, not to mention the moons are everywhere. There's those, the, the you know the best parts of Mario Sunshine where you would have where you wouldn't have flood you'd go into these little challenge rooms there are so many rooms like that in this game like here's this weird door go in it and solve its mystery and the platform over here and everything is this bite-sized delicious cake oh my god is it good there are phenomenal things to see the ending new dunk city's ending is good too for nostalgia stuff and i think every single world is really good overall uh, a couple i mean there's there's ebbs and flows with it but i want to go back and play it you know that there's so much to see and do the fact that you beat the game and what like a third of the moons are locked away half the moons are locked away yeah the, those moons and sunshine was like that's like what i remember about that game you know i played that game in 2004 or something right I haven't played it since that's what i remember i remember I remember fighting Bowser Jr. in front of that uh, Ferris wheel. And I remember the stupid squids in that haunted house or whatever on the beach. There's a caterpillar boss. And those optional levels, which were so good. And Galaxy had a ton of them too that were so good. 
I can't wait to get further into the into the post game and see kind of these optional worlds you get to go to and all of that and, and see what it does because a couple of the things I've done just just so good and I'm not even a person who has a ton of nostalgia for Mario like I like Mario a lot but he's not my dude right Zelda Link is my dude and I, I this this is the best like I don't think how, how anyone could play this game and not say this is the best 3D Mario game like hands down not even close get those nostalgia goggles off this is the best 3D Mario game by a mile it might be the best mario game it is so goddamn good it's in it's incredible and i keep because i want to do the post game review like later after i beat all the post game in 100 percent most of it in like two weeks but man some of that stuff that happened some of the moments that happened later in it, it's just like they fucking did it they fucking did it Yeah, that's the thing too. Um, not to spoil it, I don't like Mario 64. I find it very overrated. I have no nostalgia for it at all. I never even really played more than the first level back in the day. I tried to play it somewhat recently, about a year ago. Didn't really like it that much. Played like three or four worlds. There's something that happens at the end of this game that you can kind of get previewed and you can get ruined too. But you can get a preview of by going through this little portal. Even seeing that got me. Even hearing those sound effects got me. And I don't care about that game at all. So it knows what it's doing. And it does it damn well. And uh, Some of that other stuff in that level is so good. And there's so much left to explore. This is the the gift that keeps on giving from Nintendo. This is the perfectly sized. You might be crucified. <laughs> I, it's it's very obvious. I made a video once of a, and it's a joke, obviously, but it's like the the top five worst three platformers. And I put Banjo Tooie on the list twice because I fucking hate that game, and I put Mario sixty four on it. <laughs> Just to be an asshole. I'm a, I'm not a nice person. And it's a joke. People that don't understand jokes. The, the list has Banjo-Tooie on it twice. It's a fucking joke. Get over it. But anyway. the This is a, a better sized game. I feel like Breath of the Wild has too much going on in my opinion. Like it's just. It's too big. And too spread out. This is focused and honed in on. This is the world where you're doing this. These are the things you're doing. They're all freaking awesome. Every second is awesome. It's like I said, bites of delicious cake. Just cake, cake, cake. It's delicious. While you're here, Del Fox, let's talk about the Brutals, which are also a bad thing about the game. I do not like these rabbit people. So they're, they're, they're essentially what the Koopalings were. Except the Koopalings are interesting. Oh yeah, if you asked me to name each kingdom, I could. I couldn't because I'm bad at remembering names. But if you told me the name, I would know which one it is. So I see your point. They are very, they are very memorable, and they're very distinct. And the Brutals, yes, the Brutals. You start typing about the Brutals. I'll tell you about the Brutals. I just find their design so uninspired and uninteresting. They're just silly rabbits. That, that didn't mean to be a, a tricks thing. Um, I, I don't know. They're just like, why? Why? These could have been the Koopalings. Why couldn't you just do the Koopalings? Again, I don't have that much nostalgia, but I know the Koopalings. This would have been interesting. It could have been them. Why are they rabbits? Is that explained? Is that explained anywhere? Is it in the post game where it's like, oh, the rabbits found Bowser. They're friends now. Is this a tie-in with Mario and Rabbids? It just doesn't... The Rabbids are more interesting. They have a fun... I hate it, but they have a fun style about them that is very Rabbids. And the Brutals... I don't get it. It's not like there are other Rabbits in the game and you're like, well, you're... I mean, the little Rabbits you can chase. But I don't get it. I just don't. I don't like it. 
it's not like it hurts the game at all. I just don't like them. I think their boss designs are good. And that's fine and dandy. But there could have been the Koopalings, man. Yeah, they're the Koopalings in disguise. Ooh, I'd accept that. That would be fine. Is that a spoiler? I would want that. I would want, I'd be, I'd be fine with that. So did I miss a moon there where I could go left? That's what I'm watching this old footage too, to see like what I missed here. And there's so much stuff you can miss. It's everywhere. There's stuff everywhere. I don't really mind the designs that much. To me, they look nice. They look fine. As their wedding planners. Oh, okay. So he like found them to plan the wedding. Bowser's just an idiot. And I, I don't approve of this man. Too stupid. The ra I, I just can't. I can't get behind the rabbits or the brutes or the rabbits, really, to be honest. Um, but what about like where's Bowser Jr.? Where's all this stuff they did? They did. Oh, where are the booze? Oh shit! Where are the booze? There are no booze. Oh no! There's a lot of things. I and and this is similar in line to um, Breath of the Wild, where I feel like there's a lot of enemies missing and like mainstay things missing from breath of the wild like the tech tykes and even the normal deku things are, are weird and not the same and a bunch of other creatures that i don't remember now because i haven't played the game in months like likes are gone etc there are missing enemies here i just realized with the booze i guess the cheeps are here everything else is here there's some new things a bunch of new things actually with all the creatures you can capture which you didn't even talk about i do like the capture mechanic i don't mind that it's like oh this squiggly dude is here so obviously you have to use the squiggly dude i don't mind that i like getting their new powers and using them i, I think that's fine um, i wish maybe some of them were a little better but it's shocking how good some of them are like the weird stretchy guy and the weird water dude. Okay. Yeah. And I haven't bought, fought them that many times because I'm sure I'm a sure remember. I'm assuming some of that's in the post game, which makes sense. Fight them again on the dark side of the moon or something stupid, which I'm going to go to tonight. Dark side of the moon. It's, it's so good. I'm trying my best to like be negative, but good lord, is it fun. That's so good. And each world has its little things like, oh, these are these flower pots. You found a seed. You, know, you like find a seed and you run over that flower pot, like toss it in like, yeah, moons, moons, moons. It turns you into a bloodthirsty moon fiend. And that's awesome. Game's just so goddamn good. No BRB. I'm going to end the show. You'll be being and I'll be gone. BRB. I'll find you. But it's great. I think that's it. This is one of the Brutus right here. I just don't... I'm not... I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling the Brutus. The Brutus? They're all creative, though. How they fight them is all creative. Really enjoyed it. Great, great, great game. I mean, what were my complaints? I don't like rabbit people. And the controls are a little dumb. <laughs> But they're optional. Those are some good complaints to have. I don't think it's a perfect game. And that's why I want to have like another review after I've done all the post game and kind of see. Because half the game's locked away. Or at least I haven't even completed half the game based on how many moons I have. And I'm excited to go do it. So that's the show. I do this every Friday, 3 p.m. Pacific time. Twitch.tv slash the game fanatics. Next week will be something, and something else, and who knows? November is going to be slow for me, because I don't know. I might red box Call of Duty just to see what's happening, but I don't know if I do that this week or next week or some week. But it'll be a fun thing. Play some World War II, go to Redbox. I can do that. I think I got a coupon. I'm so cheap. I think I got a coupon for Redbox. <laughs> <laughs> here's the map the map's really good i think the map could be better i think some of the things with all those stars are all, i keep wanting to call them stars all the moons it could be explained like oh this is this is what you did to get this moon 
but it just has its name listed there. Like, oh, that's cool and all. And if you wanted to look up how to get Moon 16, you could. So that's nice. But I kind of wish after beating the game, it told me where, like, some more clues. I guess I could talk to that parrot guy. Yeah, it tells you. It does it. It does it. It does everything. So that doesn't end the show when it wants to. So I'll do it for it. Great game. Decent map. I think the map really could be better. Oh, another thing too, just real quick. The final bit of in previous Mario games or in previous games like this, you could get, it's like, oh, you need 30, 30 moons to uh, unlock this door or 40 moons to unlock this door right? But if you were collecting, you would have all those moons way ahead of time. They fixed that by having the doors be locked at sensible spots. So it's like, oh, you need five moons from here, not five more moons in general, which is such a smart decision. There's so much intelligence on display here. Take note, everyone. I want everything to be a 3D platformer in three years. So you got three years. Last of Us 2. 3D platformer. It can still be violent. But it's got to have some moon collecting. That's all I'm saying. Now if my mouse would move, we could end the show. <laughs>